Well, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to share with you some uh, information about this ongoing research project uh, that is based on impact assessment in North Carolina and specifically with hog farms. Uh, it's, it's, it's part of a larger dissertation research project that starts with the very fundamental question of public law and how the legal system can promote policies that are fair, sustainable, and evidence-based or work as intended. And from my vision is that, yes, the legal system can promote that policy outcome as long as there, it promotes evidence-based accountability and as long as it finds the optimal intersection point with science and with communication tools. So from this very broad and fundamental question, we land on this one legal institution of administrative and environmental law called impact assessment that many of you are familiar with. So what impact assessment does in its work as an action forcing mechanism in the sense that forces the policymaker during the policymaking process to justify the policy choices on the basis of evidence on expected impacts on different stakeholders and different attributes of welfare. And if not only it requires that written justification that becomes part of the record, but also requires a specific method that is influenced by decision theory that starts with the problem definition and goes with identifying, uh, measuring baseline, identifying alternatives, measuring impacts, and finally, a, a ranking alternatives on the basis of trade-offs and then adopting the policy. So there are two basic impact assessment tools. A lot of people, everybody knows uh, the environmental impact assessment. The other one, less known, is the regulatory impact assessment. Both were created and invented in the US in the 70s and started at the federal level. And the main difference being the EIA, or environmental impact assessment, applies to policy actions, federal, major uh, federal actions that predominantly happen at the permit level or the project or plan level, whereas the regulatory impact assessment is a requirement for proposed rules. Before, pre before adopting a rule, an executive agency must prepare one of this analysis and submit to the oversight body, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. So after invented in the US, both tools diffuse throughout the world and state jurisdictions. The EIA now is in over 150 countries, and the RA now is uh, adopted by o all OECD countries. F especially after the financial crisis, a recent trend within this legal area of the administrative and environmental law is this idea of closing the policy cycle. As Bill mentioned yesterday, with the idea of, of adaptive management and looking back or closing the feedback loop. So, systems started to incorporate not only an ex-ante analysis of the expected impacts, but also a look-back mechanism where you, if, you call it different names, or sometimes it's called ex-post evaluation. So people would look at policy and compare the forecasts that, that were made with the actual impacts on the economic impacts, the environmental impacts, the health impacts, and so forth and so on. So North Carolina has both the EIA requirement and the RIA requirement. They're called the fiscal note for the regulatory impact assessment. And, but they have narrow triggers when compared to the federal counterparts. The EIA only applies for state actions when affecting the environment, but involving a significant expenditure of public money and or, uh, the use of public lands. So that pretty much restricts a lot of its application to what we're discussing here, which is hog farms permitting. Uh, and the RA, uh, after 2003, applies not only to fiscal impacts to the state and local budgets, but also to any proposed rule that causes, that has a significant uh, economic impact, but only on the cost side. Uh, a rule that would deregulate, for instance, does not trigger this uh, increased accountability mechanism. Uh, the state also has uh, an oversight body. It's the OSBM, the Office of State and Budget Management, that reviews all the uh, RIAs, or regulatory impact assessments, prepared by agencies when a rule is proposed. And 
judge the adequacy of that statement with powers to returning the rule back, the proposed rule back to the agency, either to make the analysis more adequate or sometimes having uh, consequences to changing the rules. The North Carolina also has some sort of look back mechanism, which is a requirement uh, that was adopted in 2003, a periodic review of rules. But that, it's not an ex post regulatory impact assessment. It's not an evaluation because it's not driven by analysis. It's driven only by public comments. And the way it works is that every 10 years, every rule, every uh, regulation must be reviewed by agencies. And they do it by looking at the entire title of the administrative code and just making a formal determination of whether the rule is necessary or unnecessary. And if the decision is that the rule became unnecessary, it, it gets repealed without uh, any analysis of the consequences that of that repeal will have. So this is the general framework. And how does that apply to the hog farm environment, specifically environmental regulation? And here we find a, a big division, as we all know, in terms of the existing farms and new farms, especially with the moratorium after the Floyd, uh, Hurricane Floyd. So the way it, it applies, if, if we in North Carolina have this requirement for a regulatory impact assessment, that would be great. We could just look at the regulations that define what the standards are for hog farms, the environmental, on water quality, on, on air quality, and we could just and look back and see what justified, what were the expected impacts that justify a specific policy choice of implementing that. And we could measure that and take all the scientific input to see the effects today and go back and see, well, that choice was actually not a good choice based on how the impacts developed. The problem is that we cannot do that, uh, be, specifically with, with regard to existing farms, because the basic uh, choice of regulatory instrument for hog farms in, the, in North Carolina it's called, it's called by the literature as a management-based approach. And every hog farm must have, must have a permit, but the conditions for that permit comes with a number of different plans. And the content of those plans are not defined by a general regulation. They, in, in North Carolina, they, as Michelle was saying, they are defined by guidance documents or by a general permit. The general permit, it's, it's it, it's a misnomer in a sense because it's a general rule. But because it's not called a regulation, it does not trigger this increased accountability of the regulatory impact assessment going through the OSBM review. So uh, the one exception, and very interesting one, is with regard to odor management plan. Swine farms must present this odor management plan. And whenever there is a complaint, about objectionable, objectionable odor, and that complaint is found with merit, then that leads to an obligation to up presenting, submitting a best management plan. And if that plan fails, then the proponent, the project owner, is responsible to proposing a odor control technology. And only through that decision to whether adopt, accept, or not the proposal from the owner, there's something similar as an impact assessment process, where the farm owner must justify what are the alternatives, what are the expected impacts on health, for instance, of different uh, odor control technologies. Uh, according to information from the Division of Air Quality, only, this only happened in North Carolina once. And that one farm uh, petition, after five years of implementation of this control technology, petition to have it removed, and the Division of Air Quality accepted that. So if we don't have uh, this impact assessment tool and documents and analysis to give us this comprehensive view about trade-offs and choosing one controlled technology for, uh, over another, we could just look at the implementation data and at least know and try to figure out what kind of uh, control technologies are in place and the effects that the science are telling us. But the problem is that that is really difficult because all the information are still in paper format 
and they are on the implementation plans, on complaint responses, and on the annual inspection reports, they are in paper format in the regional divisions, and it, it has, even though it's a public record information, you have to go out and physically obtaining it and analyzing it. So, it, what would be the possible ways of improving this system and providing this additional uh, accountability or evidence-based accountability and indirectly improving the environmental regulations of hog farms in North Carolina? One obvious uh, approach would be reforming this system and expanding the, the triggers and perhaps integrating this impact assessment requiring for every and any policy uh, decision. That, in the first view, this would explode the cost of in the time that our limited staff and budget already have to do all the analysis. But actually, if you follow a strategy and that is already uh, thought of for the EIA, which is called tiering, we could just have a tier system where you start with the broad regulation and come, go back to specific implementation at the farm level and feed back the information up to the higher strategic levels. Also, better reporting from the oversight bodies could improve the system with statistics on the quality of, of uh, or the, the defects found in the RA reports that, do, are, that are submitted by agencies following the example, for instance, of the United Kingdom oversight body or the European Union. And adopting this ex post requirement or ex post impact assessment, closing the policy loop is also another measure that can improve the system. Implement open government principles. But all of this would face the challenge of political will, because at every policy reform, every legislative reform that would increase accountability would probably find uh, some resistance from. Uh, whoever has the power to make decisions. Uh, also with that, we involve cost in training, creating a new culture, and as I, as I mentioned, creating this perception or the risk of ossifying or paralyzing the process. So there's a second uh, option, and that's the point where I'm at the, the research right now, which is using, combining not only policy, science, but also information and communication technologies. What we could do and start by realizing that what creates accountability is the contrast of information between the impacts of policy choices and those policy choices. And that information doesn't have an owner. The scientific community produces a lot of that information. The, what, what is missing, perhaps, is having a comprehensive view and an integrated view of studies that are now scattered across many different disciplines and publications. So one possibility for overcoming this fragmentation is exploring or creating a network of actors connecting academia, policymakers, stakeholders, and using these ideas of open government or open science and open innovation. We saw examples here of monitoring being made by community members. We know that there's a, there's a network in, in North Carolina that flies over the, uh, the farms to, to take pictures. So those kinds of activities could feed the central uh, database that could be built with a wiki platform, for instance, where universities could just administer and, and run the system in, in, a, in that way, providing a comprehensive view of where the gaps of the science are and what in using the framework of impact assessment to really know the trade-offs that are involved in not knowing uh, the information that is that are missing. So, this is the proposal that uh, we are developing. And here at Duke, it's it's a, I think it's a really perfect setting to experiment with a project like this, since the, the interdisciplinary studies is at the core of the university, and the Vast Connections project is one example of that. So, uh, and this is. One in my vision of how to build what Michelle called the chapter six of the story and how we together write what's going to happen after this. So I hope this proved useful. I'd like to thank folks from the OSBM Division of Water Resources and Air Quality for the time and 
and share, and for sharing information for this research. Thank you. So I'd like to invite the, all the speakers uh, from this session to come up, and we can open the floor for comments. Um, I also want to uh, acknowledge that Daniel is one of the environmental health scholars uh, sponsored by this program over the last year. There were uh, several students in the um, PhD students in the earlier presentation on coal ash that were also recipients of this award. So this has been a wonderful way to uh, involve students in some of the very important uh, policy uh, questions of the day. And uh, I look forward to that program continuing and really thank uh, Daniel for participating. So if you could come up and then we can also, I know that there were lots of questions before I uh, cut them off uh, so brazenly. And so I encourage uh, those of you with questions to step up. Hi, Michelle, you kind of previewed the question that I had, um, which was about um, taking advantage of the um, opportunities for some of the cost offsets for some of the promising technology that Dr. Williams was discussing. I know that you know in North Carolina we had the Lagoon Conversion Program, uh, Lagoon Conversion Program, which provided um, a, a good bit of money to hawk farmers to transition away from the lagoon and spray field system, but very, very few farmers took advantage of that technology. So in addition to having access to, to funding opportunities and grants, we also need uh, to figure out why folks aren't taking advantage of those opportunities. And I wonder, Dr. Williams or, or anyone else, if you could speak to why um, perhaps um, Producers are not taking advantage of the funding opportunities that have been available um, and what we can do in the future uh, to, uh, to, to, to incentivize or, or, or promote adoption of these technologies, even if that funding is available, even when that funding is available. I know I'm going to probably get in trouble. <clears throat> um, <laughs> um, a lot of the pushback from the producer community was related to contractual issues. Uh, some of the technologies uh, involved um, renewables and getting power purchase agreements with the utilities. Um, and I know that a lot of the producers just got frustrated with that continued legal battle and the paperwork. Um, we've got to find a way to short circuit that if we're going to have an effective conversion process. I'd like to add just one more thing about um, potential funding opportunities. So. Lloyd Ray Farms, half the funding may have come from the government, but the other half was private organizations, Google, um, Duke Energy, and Duke University. Um, Google wants to build a lot of um, infrastructure here in North Carolina, so their goal is to make that as renewable as possible and invest in the local community. So leaning on those kind of opportunities and finding and identifying those organizations have been crucial to our success, and I'm wondering if that would be a possibility for many other farms to leverage Maybe not Google, I don't want to give our contact information away, but um, those kind of organizations are also interested in this kind of work. Okay, uh, I have a comment and then a question. And the comment is directed to you, Dr. Mike Williams. Uh, uh, one of the more, or perhaps the most nagging issue from an environmental perspective in eastern North Carolina is the issue surrounding CAFOs. Uh, Dr. Williams, I speak on behalf of the scientists who did a lot of the work that we owe you a huge debt of gratitude for having shepherded us through very turbulent times in the 90s and the early 2000s. So thank you very much for shepherding us. But I also believe that uh, super soil technology is actually over the finish line, simply because as follows. Uh, we, you have reduced the cost in the third generation by as much as 
uh, you have not taken advantage of economies of scale yet, which is to say, let me give you an example, and that's the example I gave in the Netherlands. In the 70s, we used to do calculations, engineering students used to do calculations by an instrument called a slide rule. And most of the young students don't know what a slide rule is, but be that as it may. And along, and it used to cost about $100 for a slide rule. It added, multiplied, divided, did log, and lots of other things. Along came a calculator, which only did add, subtraction, multiplication, division. And the first generation cost us $1,500 to buy a calculator from Texas Instruments. Today, you go to buy a shoe, and they give you a free calculator, OK? So the economies of scale has reduced the cost uh, by a considerable amount. Uh, super soil technology, as you well know, I've called it an engineered solution. And so being an engineered solution, it, if you were to go to economies of scale, it will reduce the cost considerably from 60%, perhaps considerably a lot more. So I want you to think about it that, indeed, we have not taken advantage of economies of scale vis-a-vis -vis super soil, even though the third generation has brought it to less than 60%. Now my question, and the question is directed to you, Mark. In the technology that you sh showed, there is no question that it'll, you'll get carbon credit, and you will reduce order. But there is a fundamental flaw. And the fundamental flaw is that you have taken non-criteria pollutant, which is ammonia and hydrogen sulfide, and converted them into a criteria pollutant, which is nitric oxide and sulfur dioxide, which means now, now you are obligated to find a technology or control strategy to control NOx and SOx, which you have not taken into account. Yeah, I, thanks for the, uh, for the comment. Let me first just... Uh, make a comment on cost reduction. And uh, I think you take a, a perfect example uh, of how the electronics has had orders of magnitude cost reduction. And I wish it was possible on things such as motors and pumps and tarps and things like that. I think the, um, the cost reduction that you can hope to see on the, the technologies that we're on the board, maybe uh, not orders of magnitude, but maybe three, four, five folds maybe, but there's only so much that you can save on a tarp because of the cost of the raw materials and others. Um, and so I think, I mean, there is hope. Uh, I don't think the burden is on the academics to uh, prove and do those cost reduction, but really to um, make the technology better, to uh, uh, find new twists by way, uh, uh, and, and, and um, uh, make the, the processes better, uh, and then yeah, the burden is on uh, industries and businesses uh, and the regulatory agencies to put the, the burden on uh, um, the businesses to uh, force those technologies, because ultimately it's regulatory driven. Um, now, on your, your second comment, um, the, the NOx and the SOx are, uh, indeed, they're regulated, uh, and um, the part of the things that we're monitoring. Uh, if I look at uh, what we're doing and the chronology of things uh, as, as this project evolved, we were primarily concerned first with the organics uh, and then with nitrogen uh, and, and phosphorus. Um, I, I don't think it's a, very, it's a totally fair criticism to say that, uh, you know, I've, I've uh, solved one problem and I'm, and I'm uh, creating another. Uh, we're monitoring uh, the, uh, some of the parameters, but not all of them. We haven't monitored uh, N2O yet, uh, and I, I think I, I take the, the criticism here, and, and we should be doing more. Thanks. I actually have a question for Dan Daniel about mm -hmm. the lithium. Um, so I'm really interested in, in that idea, and particularly as an attorney, I'm always looking for ways that information that we gather through discovery can be used to create structural reform and policy. Um, and my question is, is, I guess, given a lot of the ag-gag laws, particularly the fact that the one in North Carolina is still going on, public justice is actually challenging it, but 
you know, is, is that something that you consider? Do you think that this wiki would open people up to, I guess, prosecution under those ag gag laws? And for example, in Wyoming, um, you know, we lost in the district court, and even though we're appealing it, the loss stands. The ag gag laws actually extends to sampling data, and so going and sampling can, and then turning that information into a government agency opens you up to prosecution under the ag gag laws. And so I'm just wondering if. In looking at your wiki, it's something I think could be really fantastic, but uh, is that something that you considered, and what do you think the dangers there are? Well, thank you for the question. Uh, well, I think it's more of a question of the how much of the problem this ag, ag laws represent and how much a project like that could amplify the exposure and the risk of people from prosecution or, or, or litigation. Uh, and I, I'm still not not uh, certain whether, in, in in what circumstances, the the right to express or to just say that your your house is under a horrible smell and of uh, uh, hydrogen sulfide and ammonia, how that would not be like a freedom of expression, uh, and uh, and protected by the Constitution, and which is different than saying that oh, this smell comes from that farm, I'm sure about that, because they are not complying with their permit. That's a very different uh, type of accusation. So, but this is one good example of how, how much of this, if we created this platform, and if we, and this platform could be used also from, uh, to policymakers who a lot of times don't have the information, uh, we could have different types of of disciplines, we could have lawyers, we could have uh, different uh, science that could just, in terms of trying to, uh, what the technical term is, gardeners of the wiki, they could just help people from uh, giving advice and saying, well, are you sure you're making an accusation, you're, you're exposed to being liable for what you're saying, as opposed to just expressing like a, a freedom of information. Um, I have no background in engineering or economics, so I have a biology question. Um, how, with these CAFOs, do you address the fact that you take animals and put them in a space where they can't move and cram them so close together that the spread of disease is almost instantaneous if there is some? How do you not force a situation where antibiotics are given for medical reasons? It seems you're going from giving antibiotics for growth promotion to saying that's not allowed. It can be used for preventative, uh, the prevention of diseases and use the same amount. And now we're going to switch to it can be used to treat disease when they're guaranteed to get diseases. So my question is, how do you operate a CAFO with animals that can't move, that are crammed together? I'm not dealing with the, the animal rights issue, but the medical issue of disease spread. How do you do that without forcing antibiotics to be used? Um, well, there are some uh, examples of other countries in the world who've looked at the science around the societal implications of antimicrobial use in livestock production and the potential for human health impacts and have taken a precautionary action uh, in terms of regulating and banning the, uh, any uses except for, for therapeutic reasons in animal production. And they've still been able to increase production. So, and they haven't changed or moved away from a uh, vertically integrated corporate um, confinement hog production model. I'm just speaking about hogs and Denmark and other countries have done that. Um, you, we can debate about overall absolute numbers of antimicrobials being increasing or not in terms of the category and therapeutic, whether they increase or not. Um, but 
It can be done. What they have to do is look at the, you mentioned, and you put, you put as a given the idea of the confinement conditions and the animals not moving. Well, they really have to look at a lot of the spacing of the animals, the cleaning out, the sanitation conditions, uh, and looking at those variables, they've been able to increase production. Um, and I, Mike, I don't know, but there's some research around uh, spacing of animals going on. I know at NC State University to try to look at <coughs> different trade-offs with antimicrobials at certain stages of the growth production in hogs. So, um, it's, you know, I think creative things can be done if we just kind of get our heads together on this issue. I know we're running out of time. One, one minute. Um, I, I can address this from, a, from practical experience. Um, I'm a certified um, PACO auditor for poultry, and I can tell you that poultry operations that are going to the antibiotic-free it means antibiotic-free, all the way from the breeder flocks, hatcheries, all the way through production. Uh, if those birds get sick, they cannot be marketed under those rules. So the, the housing requirements for those companies are changing. They're not putting as many birds in the buildings, and there are a host of management practices that are changing to be able to reduce the spread of disease. Now, the reality of this is that the product will cost more. And who pays for that? I can't answer that question. But those are steps on the poultry side that are being taken. So we have time for one more question. Um, but I do want to address this issue also um, just very quickly, that if uh, a producer uses the organic label, that means that no antibiotics have been used at any stage of that animal's production. And if the animal does get sick, as Mike indicated, and is treated with <coughs> antibiotics to overcome that illness, that animal has to be taken out of that organic certification process. It can still be marketed and sold for uh, human consumption, but it cannot come with the organic label, which brings along with it a higher price premium in the marketplace. So that has been used as a proxy for the types of things that you're talking about right now until we get to a better use model of uh, regulation of antimicrobials. So one more question. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, my question is about carbon markets and carbon trading. And dealing with the carbon markets and carbon trading, information is really necessary to have establish an effective system for carbon markets. And we touched on today a lot about the lack of information, like gaining information um, that we're doing through the research now, but also there's a lack of information in the farming industry. And you all touched on um, not even knowing the price of Rex dealing with the situation that you're in now. And how do you see carbon markets growing when, and I think this is also a political question of not being able to get the information that you need to, to allow market players to come into the carbon market. And do you see that affecting the Loy, the Loy Ray farm and how sustainable that's gonna be? Because I think it's based on the premise that not only is it creating a, a system that people can manipulate, but it's also creating a system that you want to do for a carbon market. You should stand nearby in case I have any questions about your questions. Um, so yeah, carbon markets are really difficult. In the United States and in the world, we have it separated into two categories. We've got compliance-based markets, which would you normally see um, in California for their energy companies. And you have voluntary markets, Duke University, all the other universities saying, we feel that we have a moral imperative to deal with this issue, and so we're choosing to do it. Um, what does that mean? Like maybe two years down the road, not probably gonna happen, but what if we have a federal policy that says all organizations now have to offset or reduce their emissions? Then Loitery Farms, we would not be doing anything additional. Um, we could count anything probably before that, but um, it makes it really tricky when you have this like compliance-based market put upon everybody. Um, I've been very fascinated. So around the world, there's been a lot of markets that are popping up. Some are cap and trade, um, some are tax-based. So Washington State is actually experiencing and trying to figure out how do we do a tax-based program here. North Carolina is not like Washington. It's a little less um, forward-thinking in terms of the environmental movement. Um, so that might not happen here for a very long time. But then you have countries like China, where we use China as a really 
um, like one of the best examples of how regulation may, could be used to better a lot of systems. Like we saw a lot of photos of smog in the background of some of these hog farms. Um, and so with all these kind of moving forward, it makes projects like Lloyd Farms, hopefully like people will still do it and maybe just do it not even for the carbon offset benefits of the emission reduction, but do it for all the other benefits that we've been talking about today. Um, that is my hope and dream, but we will still keep seeing these kind of projects popping up and whether they're doing it for buying the carbon offsets, selling the renewable energy certificates to Duke Energy, or just to make a system better, whether it's forced by regulation or by personal choice, I don't really know um, how that'll shake out. But did I answer almost all of those? So we are very unlikely to sell our Lloyd Ray Farm offsets because we've worked really hard. Duke University needs them. But that's not to say that any other project that is similar to swine waste or could be agricultural grasslands, it could be rice, they are sold on the broader market. Um, any project that we at Duke University do, though, we don't sell those offsets because we have stake in them. And our goal in terms of like the information, we feel 90% sure about all the information that we need to know um, the REC thing is difficult because we don't own the RECs initially. Like Duke Energy, as soon as it's created, they own it. And that's a part of our contracts with them. So they don't actually have to say like, hey, we Duke University are selling you, and how much do you willing to pay? So that's why we don't have that transparency. But um, other projects would potentially have that kind of um, transparency. So. Well, thanks, Michelle. Uh, again, I uh, wanted to thank uh, our speakers today, Michelle and Abner, who did a great job uh, co-chairing uh, the, the sessions today. Um, you know, on behalf of the Environmental Scholars Program, what we wanted to achieve here was to create a uh, dialogue between a, a wide range of uh, individuals, uh, uh, community uh, leaders, uh, scientists, lawyers, policymakers. I, I think we've accomplished that, and I, I would like to encourage people to continue uh, to come back to this type of a forum, which I think is unique, and we really want to use this as a foundational start to continue and engage and to, to grow these types of relationships to really find the solutions to moving forward. So thanks for all of you who are participants, and again, well, I'm going to go ahead and close this because we're a few minutes late, and I know many people have um, a lot of things to do on the Friday afternoon. Thanks again. One final round of applause for our speakers today. <laughs>